I do know quite a bit about bats, and I'm not sure about a lot of other things. So you'll notice that I keep weaving bats into the fabric, and that's perhaps a good thing and perhaps not. So my first slide here, you've got a nice picture of a bat. It's a local bat, a big brown bat, and some question marks and some asterisks. So I know when I first went to university, 1961, I had no idea what a professor was. I thought I knew what a biologist was, and I, knew, I thought I knew that I wanted to be a biologist. But if somebody asked me to describe that, I'm not sure that I really could. You set out on a route and you don't know the route, you don't know the destination. And certainly, if you think back to yourself entering first year, most of us don't have a clue what they want to do, but they're not even sure what, what things are possible. So one of the jobs to people who are teaching first year is to engage with people and draw them in and get some idea of your sense of excitement about your subject. Then you're not sure what the pace is and you really often don't think you have any control at all. <laughs> and it almost as if the university is designed to make students feel like they don't have any control. It seems to be part of the job. It keeps them in their place, so to speak, right? So then across the bottom here, enthusiasm. I think that's really important, and I guess I think I have. And I know about the thrill of discovery. We all know about that. Now, sometimes that means Finding something in the library, that's a really important place to go looking for things you don't know. And often something you discover that's new to you isn't new to anybody else, but that doesn't matter if it gets you excited. And I think that's what matters, and not being afraid to be enthusiastic and to be interested. There then is the other side of that, which is sharing. I think a lot of people really do want to share their knowledge and their enthusiasm and their interest, and I don't think there's anything wrong with making that clear. It may be especially important to undergraduate students who perhaps don't have that many role models of people that might take them that way. So, I, for me it was bats, um, and I even have a couple of slides here about bats. So, this <laughs> is 1965. Um, we're standing outside a cave on the Moira River, which floats into Lake Ontario at Belleville. And I'm tied to the biology professor who introduced me to caves and bats. He happened to be a botanist, but that was okay. He was interested in other things like bats and caves. And what we were looking for at that time was where bats went in the winter. So some people were putting little bird bands on bats, and we'd go and try to find them in the winter. And we kept not finding them. So the bats you found in the summer were never the ones that you saw in the winter and vice versa. So this was sort of a mystery, but it was very exciting then to go underground. How many of you have been in the cave? Ah, so you know, right? It's very exciting. You always have that huge sense of discovery. And for us, it was going to be a bunch of banded bats just around the corner. And we were then going to get some picture about where the animals go from summer to winter. So we can see a couple of bats by themselves hibernating and then a whole cluster of them jammed together. And we still have the same problem today, only it's made worse by the arrival of white nose syndrome, which has killed off literally millions of bats in, in North, North America, United States and Canada. And then that's me in one of my first caves. So at first I wasn't clear whether it was the bats or the caves that were more exciting, but it didn't take very long, at least for me to discover it was actually the bats. And once you get hooked on bats, they just keep uh, drawing you away, it seems. And the other thing, of course, about the bats was it often meant you had to be outside to study them as opposed to sitting in a lab or a classroom. And for me, that also was important. So 1918, this is a mine up near Renfrew, Ontario, a molybdenite mine that had been opened in 1906. And it was closed in 1918, just after the First World War. And this is what it looked like when it was on site working. And when I first saw it, it looked as it does on the right, covered with snow. This was in 1965. And by then, it was really a mother load of bats. There were probably 40,000 bats hibernating in that old mine. And for me, that was like going to heaven, right? I mean, so many bats in one place. There's another old mine over near Barry's Bay that's every bit as exciting as good. Everybody knew about this one, whereas before I found it, 
people didn't know about this one. So at the time, I think it was the 10th of May, 1965, when I was supposed to be at convocation, I was up at the mine um, checking out the bats. And that gives you some idea of where my priorities lie, for better or for worse. So that's how it got started. But then, in July 19, 19, 2018, my wife and I were in central Italy. And you think, oh my God, who would go to central Italy? Well, there's a whole bunch of reasons to go to central Italy. This is a Bruzzo National Park. It's up in the mountains, about 1,200 meters elevation. And there's a whole bunch of little villages scattered around here. But the real attraction for that, apart from the wine and the food, is the bats. Because at, in this area, there are troughs that were set up, are set up, for watering livestock. So you have to share the troughs with horses and cattle, and they leave their souvenirs behind that you probably don't want to sit in, but you probably end up standing in. And the other thing that we met in this situation was the dogs that take care of the cattle and the sheep, not so much the horses. And these are amazing dogs. When you come upon the dogs with the cattle or the sheep, they walk stiff-leggedly out in front, and they look you right in the eye and say, come on. Come on. So you have to treat the dogs with some respect, but they're quite fascinating just by themselves, even if they don't fly. A friend of mine in Italy has for 20 years been studying the bats that come to these troughs at night to drink. We haven't seen the bats there at the same time as the cattle and the horses and the sheep, but certainly when you go there at night, that's what you get. So here's my wife setting up some equipment on the side of the trough. And this is what the troughs look like there, about six meters long, about a meter wide in terms of water surface. The bats come in and drink, but the interesting thing is they touch down to drink for eight thousandths of a second. So this is a very quick splash, and that means you spend a lot of time messing around with your equipment, trying to get it just right to get the bats. So here's one of the bats. It's a barbastel. It's a European species. I had never seen before so it was on very, very high on my list of things I absolutely had to see in Italy, and they certainly didn't let me down. So now there's a whole bunch of interesting questions. Bats are not very big. These animals may have to make several visits to get the water they need, but we're not even sure of that because we don't necessarily have tags on the bats. We don't know what they actually do. So this is, again, one of the neat things about these animals is there's always something you don't know about them. And as soon as that's the case, it means there's endless opportunities for students and other people. And because there are like 1,200 different kinds of bats in the world, there's lots of room for several people to work on them. You don't necessarily have to get into a fight with anyone for studying the animals. The fascinating thing about the photography is it takes a certain amount of mucking around to get it just right. But when it's right, it's really quite wonderful. The other thing it allows you to see is changes in the bat's facial structure, which probably relate to echolocation, which I will say more about in a few minutes. So the interesting thing is for this bat, which emits its signals through its open mouth, bat's flying with its mouth open, how does it drink and echolocate at the same time? <coughs> you know what happens when you try that, right? So we don't know how the bats get around that. There's other bats that emit their signals through their nostrils, and presumably they can drink and echolocate at the same time. So we need to get information about what those bats do, and that's something that should keep me busy next June. So now there's a historical aspect. You will probably all have heard of those Aros Valenzani. He was an Italian uh, clergyman, and he, back in 1794, did a bunch of experiments with bats and owls. He was interested in how bats and owls could work in the dark. And he did a whole bunch of experiments, very simple experiments. He's in a dark room inside an abbey. He's got a candle in the room and a pet owl or a tame owl. He lets the owl go. The owl flies around the room and never bumps into anything. But if you blow out the candle, the owl crashes. Crashes into the wall, crashes into the furniture, crashes into him. He went into a local church steeple and got some little bats, Pipistrelli. He let the bats go, and the bats fly around the room. And they keep flying around the room, even when he blows the candle out. But when he blows the candle out, he can't see them, so he had no idea what they're doing. So what he did was hang ribbons from the ceiling and attach little bells to them. And now, 
the bat flying around, if it brushed a ribbon, it would ring the bell. So he did the experiment, and he found the bats never rang the bell when the lights were on, the candle was on, and they never rang the bell when the candle was out. But if he plugged one of the bat's ears, it rang the bells. So he concluded, 1794, that bats could see with their ears. <coughs> Everyone thought that was hilarious. Oh, Mr. Spallanzani, <coughs> you've been drinking too much red wine. And the <laughs> Baron Cuvier, who was the David Suzuki of the time, said, Mr. Spallanzani, if bats can see with their ears, do they hear with their eyes? Ho, 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 ho. So that became Spallanzani's bat problem. And it was Don Griffin on the right as a graduate student at Harvard in the 1930s, solved the problem. And he showed that as the bats were flying around, they were producing short pulses of high frequency sound that you couldn't hear, but that was how they were operating. So he coined the term echolocation to describe how bats use echoes of sounds they produce to locate objects in their path. Classic book, 1958, Listening in the Dark, I find whenever I think I've discovered something new about bats, I go back and read Listening in the Dark. And I'm always reminded that Griffin had already thought about it. And that's also an important part of learning. So what we're going to do <clears throat> in Africa in June is study these bats, which emit their echolocation calls through their nostrils. We can get them while they're drinking, and we'll find out if they are, in fact, able to spend more time drinking because they won't be interfering with the drinking and the echolocation. It's an easy thing to, I think it's an easy thing to test, but of course we don't know until we try it. So one of the things that's overwhelming about bats is their diversity, and the faces give you some impression of that. So the bat on the left is a flying fox type bat, a fruit eating bat of the old world. The bat on the right is a Jamaican fruit bat, and these are animal, they're fruit bats, whether you go to the tropics in the old world or the new world. And you can see the facial structures are quite different. The leaf on the nose of the Jamaican fruit bat probably has something to do with echolocation. And that's almost a recurring theme. And then some bats have very bizarre faces. The bat on the left is the barbus that we saw drinking. The bat on the right is a horseshoe bat. There's no doubt that the ears and the facial structures have a lot to do with echolocation, either transmitting the signals away from the animal or picking up the echoes coming back. For bats to succeed at this, they have to make sure that they don't deafen themselves because the outgoing signal is much, much stronger than the returning echo. So I think when we look at bat faces, there's a whole bunch of form and function stories there that are still waiting for people to discover them. And then there are some bats that just look like nothing on Earth. The wrinkle-faced bat on the left I have no idea what its mother was eating, but its face is certainly quite spectacular. The one on the right, I think, is even better, a ghost face bat. And these are just great stories in form and function and behavior that are waiting to be told. If we back off then, bats <clears throat> belong to the order Chiroptera, Chiroptera hand and wing, because their wings are made from elongated arm, hand, and finger bones. And you can see this, the Jamaican fruit bat or Egyptian fruit bat on the left, and the skeleton of the wing on the right. So you can see the thumb sticking up there very prominently, the forearm, the upper arm, elbow. All of these things are basically mammalian. They have the same basic structures that we do. A CT scan that was done of a bat over in Robarts <clears throat> shows interesting things about bone density. The whiter the bone, the denser it is. So you'll notice then that the wing bones and the clavicles, or collar bones, are quite bright white. The teeth are quite bright white, and the cochlea, the inner ear bones, are also bright, and those are the bones that are toughest on a bat, because they're the ones that have to do all the really hard work. It's a big deal for a bat to separate what it says from what it hears, and until it can do that, it's not going to echolocate. The same thing applies to blind people that echolocate, to cetaceans, the whales, but also to the echolocating birds. So it's just a way of life for animals that use echolocation. Another thing about bats is they're small. The bat on the left is a little brown bat flying away from my hand. If you were holding the bat in your hand, it would feel the same as a quarter and two dimes. 
it weighs eight grams, and that's a full-grown adult bat. That's very impressive. Most bats are tiny. The smallest bats weigh two grams, which is the same as a dime. So it's hard to imagine something as mammalian as a bat, as mammalian as us, that as an adult weighs two grams. That's astonishing. The bat on the right is one of the world's biggest bats. It has a wingspan of about two meters, but it weighs about 1,500 grams. That's the same as three pounds of butter. So we're not talking about gigantic animals. There's no, there's no evidence from the fossil record there were ever bats that are much bigger than that. It always seems to be that's what you get. So most bats in Canada, the biggest bats, a hoary bat that weighs 30 grams. Again, it's not, these are not big animals. <clears throat> now, one of the remarkable things about our bats is that mating occurs in August and September. Female bats, you see a pair of mating bats on the left there. A female bat will mate in succession with several males, and male bats will mate in succession with several females. The female stores the sperm in her uterus. So the picture on the right is looking inside the uterus of a female bat. It's chock full of sperm. But the interesting part of this story is the litter size is one. She's going to have one kid a year. She mates with five different males. How does she sort the sperm? Who decides who fertilizes the egg? <clears throat> male biologists are inclined to call it sperm competition, which is a very male thing. But it seems to me the sperm's in the female from September to April. I think it's much more likely that the females have some nifty way of sorting the sperm. That's something we don't know about, but it would be lovely to find out about. Then, the other thing about being a bat, a female bat, is the business of giving birth. A newborn baby bat weighs 30% of its mother's weight. So if the mothers in the group will think about that for a minute, right? It's a hell of a lot of baby, right? It's interesting because the birth canal on the left, it's about two millimeters wide. But during birth, it expands to 35 millimeters wide to allow birth to take place. So female bats are really heroes. They invest huge amounts of energy in their young. You can see a developing embryo there on the right. You notice the wings are very tiny. Baby bats are always born back in first. It would be a breech presentation for humans. I think the reason that happens in bats is if you try to come out head first, you get your wings all tangled up in the birth canal, which wouldn't be any good for the bat or its baby. So it gets better. Female bats produce vast amount of milk because the young bat eats its weight in milk every day. So here we see a little brown bat, 75% of her body weight in milk every day. If that were translated to human terms, it would be a 45 kilogram woman giving, you know, producing 33 kilograms of milk a day, right? It's totally astonishing. It's no wonder the litter size is one. Right? Because more than that would be quite challenging. The bat drinking, which we photographed in Italy, has a dark spot just under her shoulder. That's the nipple. And it's showing that she had been nursing. She probably wasn't still by that time in July. But it's a huge operation to keep the young growing. Within about three or four weeks of being born, they're large enough to fly. They've reached adult linear dimensions, and they can start to operate. So that makes bats very interesting from that point of view. Here's a big brown bat at age three days. So they're born naked, the wings are very small, the eyes are closed, by three days the eyes are open. Here in this part of Ontario, North America, big brown bats have twins, typically. But genetically, the twins have two fathers, right? So in other words, you have a litter, two young, father one, father two. So what that's telling us then and we know nothing about the mating system of these bats, is these female bats, like the little brown bats, are mating with more than one male, but it only makes more interesting the question of who decides which sperm fertilizes the egg. So all these things about bats just keep drawing you in deeper and deeper, almost no matter which kind of biology you think you're interested in. So for all of this, we don't know very much about the interactions between female bats 
and their young. We do know, we think, that male bats are just sperm banks. They don't have anything to do with taking care of the kids, as far as we know. On the left is a little epauletted fruit bat from Africa, but on the right, a picture taken on Christmas Day, is a mother bat and her young, which is probably about three or four weeks old at that stage. So we don't know how the young learn their home range. We don't know how the young learn where to go to feed. We presume that there's an awful lot of interaction between mother and young, but it's not an easy thing to study, and we don't know so much about it. Another thing about bats that's astonishing is they live a long time. Right now, the age record for a bat in the wild, a little mouse eared bat from Europe, is 45 years. So that's 45 years for an eight gram animal. The oldest record in Ontario is 35 years for an eight gram animal. That's astonishing that something so small would have such a long lifespan. It's very different from mice, for example, which tend to have bigger litters and tend to live perhaps three years, but usually not. So what bats are is very high energy machines. As far as we can tell, a male bat in summer eats half its body weight in food every night. But a lactating female is eating more than her body weight in food every night. I have two assistants here to show you what that means. Ben, on the left, is sitting beside half his body weight in pizzas. Eleanor, his sister, is standing beside her body weight in pizzas. So that's, how the hell do they do that, right? I mean, that is huge levels of food intake. Think of your favorite food. Think of how much you weigh. And imagine having to eat half your body weight in pizzas, right? Or whatever your favorite food is. So that makes bats particularly intriguing. So we do know then they're small animals. Smallest ones are two grams, the biggest ones are about 1,500. When the bat's heart is flying, a little brown bat, heart's beating 1,200 times a minute, low reproductive output, huge size at birth, and they can live a long time. So you can imagine then, if I go back to 19, probably 63, in the library reading about bats and thinking, holy Moses, because we don't know, we didn't at that time know nearly as much about bats as we do today, and it's just totally captivating because you have all these question marks. How could they possibly do that? And you don't know the answer. So one of the things that's very interesting, our colleagues at the University of Guelph have developed a barcode of life project that allows you to take a piece of insect, for example, do a DNA barcode, and it'll identify for you what species of insect that is. So if we go inside a piece of bat shit or a bat stomach, you see on the right a little jumble of insect material. Now we can take out the pieces of insect material and we can get a list of what the bats actually eat. That's something the ecologists have been dreaming about doing for years because we knew they ate insects, but there's a lot of different kinds of insects and it matters whether it's this or that. But the trouble is we end up a little reef of common knowledge. Everybody knows that bats eat mosquitoes. And they all think they can sit naked in their yards at night if there's bats flying around that'll keep the mosquitoes away. Try it. <laughs> it doesn't work so well. And what we've been able to find out is bats do occasionally eat mosquitoes, but they never eat enough mosquitoes to make any difference to the population of mosquitoes. The trouble in saying that is all these people that are prepared to like bats because they think the bats do us a big job and a big favor with respect to mosquitoes, it's not necessarily so. So, what isn't obvious about this so far is that when you do these things, you don't do them by yourself. So usually you end up with a group of people working somewhere and it becomes a team operation, which I think is also very important. We need to learn how to work in teams. We need to teach our students how to work better as teams. And that's something that's pretty vital. This is in a cave in Cuba. We were there to take pictures of bats. And it gives you some idea of how much fun. You couldn't stand up in there, actually. So Sherry and I are the only ones smart enough to be wearing hard hats. But that's perhaps light. So the next thing that becomes interesting is where do bats spend the day? People think that because bats fly, they must be like birds. They must build a nest and lay eggs. 
Well, we've already gone over that. They don't lay eggs, they give birth to live young. Birds build nests because they lay eggs, and as we all know, eggs roll. So if you try to balance an egg on a branch, you're just making scrambled eggs for whoever lives downstairs. In bats, baby bats, you can hang them up as soon as they're born, so they don't have to build a nest. But some of them, like these guys in Costa Rica, build tents. They build the tent by biting along the leaf veins, the leaf folds over, and they have something that protects them from the rain and from the sun, and tent-making bats are something that's a recurring theme and fairly common. It's easy to think that perhaps bats are limited by the number of roost possibilities there are. Some bats often live in buildings. This is a small church in a small town in South Africa. Town is too strong a word, village. Three churches in the town, Dutch, Re Dutch Reformed, Roman Catholic, and Anglican. This one's Anglican, not that it matters, right? What they have in common, apart from God, is bats. They all have bats in the church. Nobody wants the bats. So the pastors from the three churches met, and they each put up two bottles of red wine. The deal was whoever could get rid of the bats would get all the wine. They met two weeks later. <clears throat> the Dutch reform minister said he'd gone into the church with his shotgun and he'd blasted away and now he had holes in his roof and bats. <clears throat> the Roman Catholic priest was appalled at the violence involved in that solution. What he had done is gone into the church and with a box, he put all the bats in a box and driven them 100 kilometers inland and let them go. The bats were home before he was. <laughs> So the Anglican scooped up the wine saying, it's really simple, I confirm them, they stay away. And you have these little intersections, not enough Anglicans here, but anyway, <laughs> the idea is there. But that, this whole interaction between people and animals is interesting. In Naples, we found an exhibit, it's a little oil lamp from um, Pompeii. It has a lovely little bat on it. You could tell that the artist was a little bit fixed on male bats as opposed to bats in general, but you often find bats as symbols of fertility for the reason that's graphically presented there. Now what's more interesting for bats than folklore is vampire bats. Vampire bats, there's three kinds in the world and they eat only blood as adults. The people that used to live in what is now northern Colombia, northern Venezuela, for them, the bats, vampire bats, signified the fertility of women. Has she been bitten by the bat? Is she of childbearing age? Has she started to menstruate? So that bats do not necessarily get portrayed in a negative way, they can also be portrayed in a very positive way, and fertility is pretty positive. I don't have a good picture of one of those representations, but we can talk about vampires. So vampires are about 30 grams. They eat about two tablespoons of blood a day, and they need two tablespoons of blood a day. They're one-stop shoppers. So they're going to a cow or a pig or a chicken or a person. They use their front teeth, upper side there, the portrait, very sharp incisor teeth, and they take out a divot of skin. It's about five millimeters in diameter and five millimeters deep. And that's going to give them the blood, the two tablespoons full they need, because in addition to making a kind of wound that bleeds a lot, they also have chemicals in their saliva that inhibit bleeding. So the bat gets its two tablespoons full of blood, which a cow is not going to miss, which none of us would miss, it's very little blood. It's interesting, there's now a drug on the market for treating, a drug for treating strokes on the market, is called Draculin, and of course, it emulates the saliva of vampire bats because they're very good at breaking up blood clots. That's what they do. Now, the thing about vampire bats is they aren't very popular, but that's true of blood feeding animals in general. But they're really intriguing. So, this bat is flying out of a tunnel in a Mayan ruin. The tunnel has been dug by looters, and the vampire bats have moved in. So, what's happened at the same time? In, this is in Belize in Central America, vast clearing of land, and what really they're doing is turning all this into fast food outlets for vampire bats. There's lots and lots of cattle, and the bats are certainly visiting the cattle on a very regular basis. 
So you can see along the top of the cow's neck there, little streaks of blood. It's very easy to see which bats, which cattle have been feeding bats during the night. The reason you don't want that, of course, is rabies. Rabies is a disease caused by a virus, and it's often spread in saliva, and vampire bats appear to be very good vectors for that. A group of us have been going to Belize now for several years. We have a number of ongoing projects, some of which involve vampire bats. So one of the things that's not clear is how far does a vampire bat go to find its cattle? So some colleagues from Germany had neat little GPS backpacks that we could put on a vampire bat and then catch it again in the morning and find out where it had been during the night. And this gives us an idea of how big an area the vampire bats are actually covering. Vampire bats, if you look really carefully, the one on the right, this, the right-hand one, the picture on the right, has got a band on it, so we've been putting tags on the bats to try and get some idea of what exactly they're doing. And it's one of these things that everybody thinks they know, but ne not necessarily do we really know what the animals are doing. So I mentioned this group of people. We started, I guess this is our, be our 13th year in 2019. We would meet at a lodge. We just basically take over the lodge. There's about 60 people. We spend two weeks and it's just a workshop, but there's no presentations, there's no posters, there's no papers. It's just people that are interested in bats sitting around, working with bats, learning about bats. It's a very nice way to spend time with your colleagues because it often gives you a chance to learn things that you wouldn't ever have found out before. I recommend this as an alternative to meetings. We're all accustomed to meetings where you never have enough time anyway. This is much better. You also get to meet some interesting creatures, some of them colleagues. <laughs> so the other thing we've been doing there is taking bats to the local schools. There's two local elementary schools. So we take a bunch of bats over to the elementary schools so the kids can meet them. They can see a vampire bat. They can feel its wing and look at a fruit bat or a little insectivorous bat. And immediately it changes, we think, their attitude towards the animals, which is probably a really important thing to do. The next slide shows that you don't have to go to Belize to do this. And you recognize our colleague here giving a talk to a science group at High Park in Toronto. This is a bat program at High Park, and they asked Mel to come and talk because, of course, he studies echolocation in people, and the theme connecting them to bats is very good. So, I've been rambling around, giving you some idea of how alluring the subject is, how rich it is, and how you keep peeling away layers and you keep finding different things. So I was really lucky I discovered that generally as a student, and it just keeps on getting better and better, and I think that's true whether you're in the classroom or whether you're doing your own research. The fact that you go and work with people, this is in Jamaica, a little research station in the middle of nowhere, it started life as a British blockhouse in about 1760. Got a great colony of bats in the roof and a huge cave nearby that has lots more bats in it. Works like the thing in Belize is there is no boss. It's just a bunch of people that are interested in something and it's interesting. But one of the things we did in Belize, we started looking at tongues, bat tongues. Some bats visit flowers. They're the nocturnal equivalents of hummingbirds. So this is a bat coming up to a banana flower on the left. The first part of the story that's interesting is that it's called a brat. That's what botanists call it. It looks like a petal, but it's really a modified leaf sticking up above the flower. That is actually a beacon for the bat. It reflects a strong echo back to the bat from its echolocation calls, and it directs the bat to connector is. And if you've looked at a banana flower, you know they're open for several days and the opening rotates around the flower. So if you do a nasty thing to the bats and you clip off the bract, say at four in the afternoon, the bats know where the flower is, but they don't know where the hell the nectar is. If you wait until seven at night to clip off the bract, they know where the, bra the, where the nectar is, but they didn't before. But what's really just almost as interesting is the fact that these bats have extremely long tongues. So if the bat were flying around its tongue, it'd be hanging out to its navel. So what they're doing is they're hovering in front of the flower, they pump blood into their tongue, which extends the tongue, and raises all these papillae. So the tongue is really a mop, just soaks up the nectar. 
It's really, really neat. It's a very small operation, but we spent some time playing with it a bit more. So this is down in southern Arizona, the Southwest Desert Research Station. We know what the bat is, but we hadn't expected it to fold the tip of its tongue back. And the bat tongue people we know, and you can imagine, that's not a big field. There's not a lot of people doing bat tongues. Nobody had ever heard of such a thing before. So it shows you that if you've got your eyes and your ears open, you're often able to come up with something new. So, my last slide. What I think is particularly rich, for me it's bats, for somebody else it's spiders, somebody else it's birds, it can be whatever you want. Find something like that and just get immersed in it, because if you do that, it pretty much guarantees you a career path that's going to be rewarding for you. I know there's going to be all sorts of speed bumps and distractions along the way, but it is fun. The business of being able to work with other people and work together with people instead of feeling like you're competing with them, I think is pretty rewarding. So thank you for listening to me rant about bats. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, of course. Okay. Oh, okay. Research grants. Well, so I'm retired, right? So that means that I can do anything and I don't have to report to anybody, but I do have to be able to find the money legally as opposed to <laughs> illegally. Uh, I first, all right, so my career path. I graduated from the in 1969, and I got a job right away at Iowa University in Ottawa. And this is the days before NSERC, Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, it was the NRC, the National Research Council. Man, I got a grant of $3,600 from them. That was unbelievable. Now this time, I have to tell you also that my starting salary was $10,500 a year. And they had to give me more money because there was a change in the collective agreement with the deal that originally did with them. So, I, I yeah, I've been reasonably successful getting money, but never make money the way many people do today. So I had my last answer grant expired finally in 2015. I chose at that time not to apply again because I figured I'd have my share. Um, I thought it was really nice. A lot of what I do is fairly low tech, so you don't need vast amounts of money. White nose syndrome. So white nose syndrome is a disease, the fungus disease that was first discovered in India, Albany, New York in 2005 or 6. It seems to be the European strain of the fungus that seems to have come in on some of these boots. And since then it was all over eastern Ontario by 2010, then it's killed literally millions of bats. What happens is the bats are hibernating, I didn't talk about that, but they with hibernation in September, they come out in about April, and they have very little stored fat. But they only wake up about once every 90 days, which is very different from ground squirrels, for example. And what white nose does is have them waking up two or three times a week, and that means by January there, they have no energy left. So it's very bad news. It is spread back to that. It is, um, the first thing in Canada knows the most about it is Craig Rose, University of Winnipeg. He is very good. So if you don't have a chimney, you don't have bats, because the smoke just filters out through the roof. Yeah, but at the same time, we were cutting down forests, so some bats moved into buildings and some bats didn't. 
As far as industrialization is concerned, I think it's more the habitat destruction that's hampering the bats. Most of the industrial sound is lower frequency than what the bats are producing. I didn't go into the details, but bats produce very intense signals. So if you measure the intensity of a bat's call, 10 centimeters from its mouth, it's 130 dB. So that's the pain threshold. To, to put that into context, if you go home tonight, you get up on the ladder and put your ear 10 centimeters from your smoke detector and set off the smoke detector, that's only about 108 dB, and dB is a long scale. I don't, I don't know anyone who succeeded in showing there is, there was a paper about radar influencing bats, but now one of the authors on the paper is sort of claiming he was asleep and he didn't know about that. So I don't think it's a big deal. I think the worst problem bats have is people's attitude towards them. People think they get your hair, not my problem. Uh, people think that they eat blood, and some of them do. Um, so it depends where you are. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, uh, I'm really intrigued by how long that took. Uh -huh. That's 45 years. Yep. Exceptional for an for animal that size. Yep. Um, do you know what people are, again, speculating as to why? And how does that maybe compare to birds, which also some of really small birds can live very long as well? <laughs> okay. I don't think, I think there's whole bunch of molecular type explanations of why it's the case with bats, but I don't think anybody really knows. As far as birds are concerned, I honestly don't know. I don't think you've had the small animals living so long. I mean, the real champions are the, the whale sharks from Greenland, 350 years old. That's just unbelievable. And some tortoises are probably living that long. The problem with knowing how long something lives is that you don't ever see them in the wild enough to know who they are. Because was it Elmer the elephant who was killed in the train tracks here a few years ago? If you look at the pictures of this elephant over years, for a while it was an African elephant, then it was an Indian elephant, then it was an African elephant again. So it seemed to have lived 80 years, but we kept changing species. Thank you.